So you are with us today and we are going to be sharing building STEM skills using Animal Watch products. And we are so glad that you are with us today for that. Um, before we get going, we want to just give you let, a little um, tipping of our hat to the Museum for American Printing House for the Blind. You know, we're talking about math and STEM products today, and you just never know what is hidden in that museum that uh, are artifacts of things within our professional history that is also talking about um, math and history uh, STEM products. So to bring some history to your feed if you're on social media, we just want to let you know about the Museum of the American Printing House for the Blind, that it is now on Facebook and Twitter. And through those platforms, we're going to be sharing stories of the challenges and the triumphs of literacy and math and people um, getting access to the core curriculum for students that are blind and visually impaired. So from our artifacts, um, some things will be even visual or virtual tours, excuse me. And so for those history buffs that are out there, people who love to be lifelong learners, tap into this, you'll never know what is around the corner. So in with today, we are excited to be talking about STEM. We are delighted to be sharing about our product, uh, the Animal Watch VI products, and to have um, Dr. Penny Rosenblum with us today to share her knowledge and expertise. So today, uh, and with Penny, I just want to give an acknowledgement that she is the Director of Research for the American Foundation for the Blind, but she's also been intimately involved with this product development of what we're going to be talking about today. Our objectives today is uh, we get to uh, learn about two things with the Animal Watch product that we offer. And so we're going to learn about the layout of both of those, the Animal Watch uh, VI Suite, and then also the one that is for building graphics uh, for literacy. We're going to get to learn what skills are needed in order to access um, these products, these apps. We get an opportunity to observe videos featuring students, which we always love when we can put our eyes and our ears on students listening and learning. And finally, an extra treat for today is we're going to learn a little bit about Project Inspire and how that project also can assist educators um, in order to uh, help support those STEM subject areas. So while we get ready to switch things over for you uh, so that you can listen to what we have to bring, I'm going to launch an, one final poll while Penny gets set up. And this poll is going to be asking you, have you used the Animal Watch VI Suite with students? So have you used this product? Um, yes, I have used the product with students. Um, I know about the product, but have not used it with students, or I'm, fam I'm not familiar. Maybe this is your first time getting to hear about it. So if you will, just answer a quick um, mention of which is you. Yes or no, or I'm just not familiar. Let us know. And I'm going to go ahead and end reporting, and, or I'm going to sh um, end the, the poll and share that we have two audience members who have used the product with students. We have 15 um, audience members with us that know about the product but haven't had a chance to use it yet. And the majority of our attendees today here in the audience, this is your first time really getting familiar with the product. So we are eager to start the learning so that we are all on the same page and you are aware of how this product can be used with students. Well, thank you, Amy. I'm Henny Rosenblum and up until a year ago, just about, I was at the University of Arizona as a research professor and I had the privilege for seven and a half years of running two Institute of Education Science projects that um, were around STEM, specifically helping our students who are pre-algebra students, so fifth to eighth grade, build their skills around math, math M-A-T-H, and science content. So we're gonna talk about the Animal Watch products, and there's two of them, 
The photo on the screen shows a student who has both a vision and a hearing impairment with an iPad in front of him and to his right is a line graph. And this is from the second product we're gonna talk about, Animal Watch VI Building Graphics Literacy. So let me give you a little background on our first project, which is the Animal Watch VI Suite. It was funded um, by the Institute of Education Sciences. So we had a research project to see if we could develop materials to support students in building their skills with math word problems. The project was awarded to Dr. Carol Beal, who at the time was at the University of Arizona. And this project ran from J July 1, 2012 to February 28th, 2016. And I have very fond memories of being at the 2012 AER conference, National AER conference, when we were trying to decide if we should take the plunge and develop something for an iPad instead of a computer and talking with uh, teachers and other attendees about this newfangled iPad thing that was just starting to come into use for our students. Now, I'm gonna to talk to you about two apps. This first one is Animal Watch VI Suite and this app and the Graphics Literacy app are both available in the App Store. These only run on iPads. Let me say that again. We're talking about two products today that only run on iPads. The easiest way to find both of them is to go to the App Store, type in APH, we all know how to write that, in the search field and you will find both the Animal Watch VI Suite that we're gonna talk about now and then the second project, product we'll talk about in a bit. So the goals of the Animal Watch VI Suite, as I said, were to evaluate if an instructional package, which in this case was an iPad app and uh, supplemental materials would help pre-algebra students with math competence that we took to make the math content, so um, the skills you need in solving word problems, images, graphics accessible for our students with low vision and blindness. We wanted to develop hints and instructional scaffolding to support students so that when they don't know the answer, they, we give them some guidance. And then we want to see as a side, how do students get information from tactile or large print graphics? We see a student with albinism using an iPad with an external keyboard and to his right, we see a book that has a picture of a, a drawing of a polar bear, which is one of the graphics in the Animal Watch VI Suite. All right, there are 24 units in Animal Watch VI Suite and we divide them into modules. So module one is kind of more of the fifth grade math. Module two is more of like the sixth grade math and module three is high sixth grade, low seventh grade. I'm not going to read to you what these modules are. I'm going to let you um, peruse the handout at your leisure, but I do want to point out in module one, we have four animals, polar bear, black rhino, California condor, and sea turtle. The information about these animals is environmental science accurate information so that at the same time students are working on skills around math word problem solving they are learning about endangered and invasive species so in module two they learn about the poison frog and the burmese python we have some really cool pictures if you have students who like are into gross things check out the burmese python um, they learn about the cheetah and the hippo in module three, they learn about the snow leopard and the white shark. On um, that white shark, really a lot of our students were very interested in that animal. And they also learn about the honeybee and the gray wolf. So I've talked to you in the handout about what math skill is um, associated with each of these animal units. And we've also given you a sample problem so that you can make sure that your student is ready for that type of math. So you may need to check in with the general ed math teacher to see, hey, should we start with module one? Should we start with module two? So if you go to awvisaphtech.org, you're going to find a website that APH hosts um, for the Animal Watch VI suite. What's on this website, okay? There is a link to the app store so you can get the accessible iPad app. Remember, it only runs on an iPad, okay? If you have a student who is not using a refreshable Braille display, but really wants Braille, we do provide the .brf files so that they are ready for you to emboss. We found in our work with students 
in the 2014-2015 uh, school year, the very few students wanted the hard copy braille of the text. We have the graphics in two forms. So for two problems in each of the units, the student has to go to a graphic, and you'll see this in just a moment, to get information. So the numbers that you need to manipulate in the word problem, you have to go to the graphic. The graphics are in the iPad, and the students can view them with low vision in the iPad. We found many students with low vision preferred a hard copy, so we've given you PDFs that you can print. If you have a Braille reader, they're going to need the graphics. And what we've done is we um, created them so that they are able to be run through a fuser, like a PIOF. These graphics for Animal Watch VI Suite are not for sale. They are not on federal quota. The only way you can get graphics for a Braille reader using Animal Watch VI Suite, and they need the graphics, folks, is to use a fuser. Um, as I already said, the content is in um, it's authentic science data. We also provide a user guide. This is um, an accessible PDF for the teacher so that it helps orient you and gives you the problems that the student is going to be solving so you can preview. So all of this is at awvis.aphtech.org. So that user guide has um, a, a, an image of it up on the screen on the cover. It has background information on how we developed the Animal Watch VI Suite app. It walks you through the features of the app. It has a table showing how the math units, those 24 math units, correspond to the Common Core State Standards. It has the content of each unit, so you can read the text that the student is going to have, the word problems. And it does not include print um, and Simbrel copies of the graphics. We, we did not put that in this user guide. And so those are not there. So the only way you can preview the graphics is to physically go into the app. All right, we make assumptions about students' iPad skills, both with the Animal Watch VI suite that we're talking about now and the second product we'll talk about in a little while, Animal Watch VI Building Graphics Literacy. So your student needs to be iPad proficient, folks. They need to be able to navigate, open, um, you know, move around within an app with buttons and pop-ups. They have to have familiarity with swiping left and right, how to tap and double tap and triple tap. If, if they're um, a voiceover or a Zoom user, they're going to need that double tap for voiceover, that triple tap for Zoom. They need to um, be able to use voiceover if that is the way that they are going to access the print. And we really encourage your students, and not just for this um, app, but students who are, are using an iPad really need to be proficient with either a Bluetooth keyboard or a refreshable Braille display. These tools are much more efficient for navigating than is swiping and looking for buttons. All right. So let's go back to 2012. That was like so long ago that I don't even think I can go back past like a year ago right now in my world with COVID. But back in 2012, we didn't have a lot of accessible materials for our students when it came to technology. So as we were thinking about developing out a product and we were making the decision, do we go with the iPad or do we go with the computer? One of the first things we knew was we wanted to make the images and the graphic descriptions accessible. We wanted to give students who are print readers the option to have audio. So we wanted an easy way for students to turn audio on and off. We also know that some students want a sound, you know, the ding, I got it right or wrong, I got it wrong. But some people find that very distracting. So we wanted to have flexibility for the user. For our blind users, we wanted to make sure our app worked with voiceover and that we had accurate Nemeth um, in, in, available to the student. For our low vision users, we knew that many of them would prefer a different font background combination than black on white. So we wanted some options there. We wanted them to be able to listen to the audio without having to learn voiceover because there's a curve there with learning voiceover. And we wanted to have a scratch pad because when you're doing math computation, you often have a scratch piece of paper that you work on. And we wanted to build that into the app. 
So the Animal Watch VI Suite app has an animal sound. You'll um, get to hear that in a little bit. Um, it has settings where I can make some of those choices we just talked about, like font color and audio on, audio off. It has a glossary of terms. So if I'm not sure what intersection means, I can look that up if it's a math term. It also has a science terms in it as well. That scratch pad and the image descriptions I told you about. And then also what we call a score report. How many questions did you get right on the first try, the second try, the third try? We see a picture of uh, a girl, she is using white text on black on the iPad screen and she's pulled up the scratch pad. So she's using her finger to do her math computation. To her right, we see a picture of a poison frog. Okay, so each of the 24 math units are structured exactly the same. And that for our students helps them have predictability. So they're putting their energy towards the math content and not trying to figure out, well, where's the button? And we see a student who is looking at um, the Braille page to the right, we see his iPad and to the right of that, we see his abacus, he's wearing headphones. So this is a student who was using voiceover and he was swiping. So how are these units laid out? First, the student meets the animals. They get some background information about the animal. Then they have a drawing. And I'm, on the cover of the book, I mentioned the drawing of the panda and then the drawing with the girl with the scratch pad of the poison frog. So we describe to them what the animal looks like and they explore that drawing. They learn about the habits of the animals and then we tell them what math skill they're gonna work on in the unit. There are six problems. And as I've said before, two of those problems require a graphic. I'm going to say this again. Those graphics are not available for sale. Low vision students can use the graphic in the iPad or the PDFs available at APH um, website. Students who are Braille users will need to have the graphics prepared for them on microcapsule paper. Most of us think of it as the toaster or the peon. That's the only way at this time you can get the graphics for Animal Watch VI Suite. Um, students get two tries to answer a problem. If they get it wrong the first time, a hint becomes available. If they get it wrong a second time, a second hint becomes available. Also, sometimes they truly don't know the answer. So after the first try, they do then get the option to give up. But after three tries, we'll tell them what the answer is. All right, I've mentioned the setting menu, menu to you where the student has choices, um, some radio buttons for all audio scratch pad answer sounds, a slider to set, set the audio playback speed, and then the black and white, um, yellow, I'm sorry, black on white, white on black, black on beige, or yellow on black. Um, options. So we're going to see a student and we're, I, I described the video for you. For those of you with vision, what is on the computer screen will appear on the right side of the video. I'm going to tell all of you that these videos were taken by me, some of them through Zoom, some of them with an iPhone. The quality is not super. If you can't hear everything, it's not about hearing every detail. It's just giving you a feel for how a student is using the materials. A low vision student sits with an iPad and his teacher off screen. He uses the built in audio. Use the button. Well, to learn about the animal featured in this unit, increase your math skills or report on your progress. Okay, use, use the other edit that doesn't Right. Care. Now, is that voice rate good for you? I remember when we did, when we set it up initially, we set the voice rate really high, high because you wanted to challenge the yourself. The audio playback speed can be set from normal speed to twice normal speed. The audio playback speed can be set from normal speed to twice normal speed. Okay, that's good. Good. Okay. Use the buttons below to learn about the animal featured in this unit. Increase your math skills. Okay, so you got to see a student um, setting that audio speed. And we actually found that some students wanted the speed below normal speed, which was interesting to us. Um, so they did not maybe have a strong listening skills. And so this could be an indication for you on if listening skills is something you need to really work on with your students so they increase their listening speed. All right, as I said, each unit begins with an introduction to the animal. So I have two screens here. The first one is um, the meet the sea turtle screen. And then the second one is what the sea, sea turtle looks like. Um, the, in this particular example, we have yellow uh, font on black background. So we're, we're gonna go ahead and watch a student. Again, I will be providing the audio description. 
The student is using a refreshable braille display to navigate the iPad. There is also a three-dimensional figure of a sea turtle on the table and a notebook containing the text of the unit and the graphics. Button. Unit homepage. Welcome to Sea Turtle Unit A. Use the buttons below to learn about the animal featured in this unit. Go to Introduction. Button. Animal Description. Previous page. Button. 40%. 35%. 30% animal description. Next page. Button. Meet the sea turtle. Sea turtles are large turtles that spend most of their lives in the ocean period. Most adults weigh several hundred pounds and the largest type, the leatherback, can be almost as big as a small car exclamation mark. Their food is mostly seaweed, jellyfish, small crabs and algae that grows on rocks and coral reefs period like other reptiles. Sea turtles reproduce by laying eggs period. The females drag themselves onto the beach and dig a hole in the sand for the eggs period. When the eggs hatch, the baby turtles return to the sea period. Image colon AC turt glossary, but animal sound, button, animal sound. Animal graphic, next page, button, what the sea turtle looks like. The graphic of the sea turtle shows him from slightly above his left side, period, his oval hyphen shaped shell has lines that indicate textured sections, period. The student picks up the three-dimensional model of the sea turtle. He does not explore it efficiently. The left front flipper and both rear flippers are visible, period. The left front flipper is long and comes to a point, period. The rear flippers are blunter and wider, period. His head extends forward, period. He has a round black eye and a small line below the eye represents his mouth, period. He is bright green, period. The student picks up the book with the graphic of the sea turtle and and visually looks at it and looks at the image of the iPad briefly and then returns to looking at the image in the book. So you saw a student um, who is a, a dual media learner was using his vision some using braille using audio so really like to think of those as tri media students. Um, he did have that little model of the sea turtle. We we piloted that with our students and found that most of them just were like, yeah, whatever. So um, the cost of, of sending out those models was prohibitive. So we don't have those models available. Though I probably have some poison frogs in my closet somewhere. All right, mentioned to you the scratch pad. And I really have to say the scratch pad came about because a student um, said to me very early on in our development, you know, I have this iPad app that I use. It has a scratch pad. You should do that rather than having me have to go get a piece of paper. And I said, well, show me that app. And I was so taken away. Remember, this is like 2013 um, with his scratch pad that I told our developer, I'm like, we need a scratch pad. So let me show you that. So this is a student who is going to be working on a poison frog problem. So this is a problem that has to do with fractions. Um, Again, I will describe it. I also haven't played you any descriptions of the pictures. So I should have told you on the last slide, there was a picture of a, a sea turtle um, looking down at it, swimming in the water. We do have a really nice um, description of that that um, we found both our low vision and our blind students use. Here we have a yellow poison frog and we would describe that it's in the foliage and the direction it's facing. So let's go ahead and watch the video focusing on the scratch pad. A student with low vision sits in front of an iPad on a Bluetooth keyboard. She has a green stylus. Problem. The golden poison frog has enough poison to kill 10 adult humans. The frogs make the poison from chemicals in the insects they eat. About 5 slash 8 of the frog's diet is ants. 2 slash 8 is termites and 1 slash 8 is other insects. What fraction of the diet is ants and termites together? <laughs> The student reads the problem to herself from the screen. The student taps the scratch button. The scratch pad comes up and she writes five eighths, two eighths, underneath it, seven eighths. She then taps the enter answer button and enters seven eighths. <laughs> And that the does sound, the students really like that. Um, and you'll hear the sound at some point, I'm sure, for when you get a wrong answer. We did have a few students who liked to get a wrong answer because they liked the sound. And that was one of the reasons we um, made sure that audio on off button is there so those sounds can be turned off. All right, let's see how a student uses the iPad built in Zoom to um, increase the size on the on the screen. So this is a student who is doing a sea turtle problem. 
and we have yellow font on black background. We have somebody um, in the image looking down at a sea turtle that is on the beach um, close to the water's edge. A student with low vision uses an iPad with a Bluetooth keyboard. She taps on the screen to have the audio play. Problem. The largest sea turtle species is the leatherback. A fully grown leatherback has a shell that is six feet long. In comparison, the shell of the green sea turtle is one slash two. How long is the green turtle's shell? The student uses the built-in Zoom to enlarge the text and read what is on the screen. The student triple taps on the screen. The text returns to normal size. The student taps the enter answer button and enters three. All right, so you got to see a student using Zoom. And that is a feature, um, an iOS feature that um, is works in just about everything. So if you have a low vision student, they really should know how to use Zoom. As I mentioned, two of the problems in each unit, and each unit contains six problems, you have to be able to go to the graphic. All problems have the option for two hints. So in this video, we're going to see a student who's going to go to the graphic and also use a hint. So let me describe this graphic. Um, it's sea turtle activity. It is a pie chart. It is divided into three equal um, sections. One's blue, one's yellow, and one's green. A student with low vision uses an iPad with a Bluetooth keyboard. She taps on the screen to have the audio play. One section shows how one sea turtle spent its time. It is divided into equal sections. Scientists track the turtle using a radio transmitter placed on its shell with a special suction cup. The turtle spent four hours swimming in the open ocean. How many hours in all? The student picks up the book and explores the print graphic visually. The student returns to the iPad and double taps. Problem. The pie graph with section shows how one sea turtle spent its time. It is divided into equal sections. Scientists track the turtle using a radio transmitter placed on its shell with a special suction cup. The turtle spent four hours swimming in the open ocean. How many hours in all was it tracked? The student looks at the graphic in the book. The student taps enter answer and enters 120. The student reads the pop-up. Sorry, 120 is not correct. Please try again. The student taps hint one button. The hint reads, refer to the circle graph to find the number of sections. The student looks between the book and the iPad. The student types enter answer and enters 12. All right, so you got the opportunity to see a student who um, went to the hint when she got the answer wrong the first time. And also you saw that the graphic was on the screen and she opted to look in the book. And we found that with many of the low vision students that they preferred the hard copy, the print copy of the graphic. So that's why we make the PDFs accessible to you on the website so that you can print those off for your student. Now, I mentioned that there is um, a second hint. So these hints are scaffolded. So in the first hint, we give kind of a clue of what to do. In the second hint, we help you with the numbers. So that first hint is going to help you set up the problem. The second hint is really gonna guide you to solve the problem. So for the problem the student was just doing, 
Um, the second hint was multiply four hours swimming in the ocean by three sections to find the hours. So we spent a lot of time and had a math teacher work with us to make these hints appropriate. All right. So what did students like about the Animal Watch VI Suite app? I've got a couple quotes here that I'll go ahead and read. I like the app because it made the little sound when the answer was wrong. Another, it would give you hints, which was nice, and you could have text read to you. A third student, I liked it because it read to me. I liked the scratch pad. Fourth, it gave me a hint on how to solve the math problems. Fifth one, I like the app better. I didn't have to use a pencil. And this is because in our um, study where we wanted to see if the app was an effective learning tool, students alternated between doing pen and paper units or pen and pencil units or paper and pencil units, wow, paper and pencil units in the app. And many of the teachers told us on the day when the child came in and the teacher would say, we're doing animal watch today. And, they, and, and the student would say, you know, paper or, or app and the teacher would say paper, the kids would get really sad. They wanted that app. Um, the last student said it felt easier to enter the answer. It was easy to use. And at the end of our research study, this was in 2014, 2015, a TVI shared. I got the student in the study as a third grader. Our Brillis would often emit graphs and I didn't know any better. Looking back, I realized what a, a disservice I did to him. Now that I know better, I will start with my young students. If we teach those kids to read graphs in second to fifth grade, they will be ready for middle school. We could not agree more. And that's why we have a second product that we're gonna talk about in just a few minutes. So let me first summarize Animal Watch VI Suite. And we do see a student in the picture who's using the iPad and she's um, got a screen up where she has a problem on the left and an image on the right. Um, the Animal Watch VI Suite assists your students fifth to sixth grade, early seventh grade with um, building their word problem solving skills. The app is accessible and is available through the App Store. I suggest you search on APH. The teacher curriculum, the BRF files should you want them, the PDF of the graphic should you want them, and the Braille graphics your student must have if they are a Braille reader for refusing are available from awvisaphtech.org. If you want to know more about our research, we have three research articles that you can read that Dr. Beale and I um, have published about our findings with this um, tool demonstrating that it helps students build their math word problem solving skills. And we see a student using a refreshable Braille display with the Animal Watch VI Suite app. I wanna stop here for a moment and ask M A Amy, I don't know where I got Emily from, but Amy, if we have any comments or questions from attendees right now that we should address about the Animal Watch VI Suite before we move on to our second product. So what's going on there in the chat window, Amy? I think that's a great uh, question and great time to pause. At this time, there aren't any questions, but it doesn't mean that we don't want to take just a moment. Uh, this is the great time that if you do have a question that is uh, very specific to what Penny was just talking about, please take this time to put it in there so that we can be able to cover the question in, in a timely way before we move on to the next product. And while you're taking a few seconds to think about that, I do wanna say that that teacher comment, Penny, about omitting graphs, of having the habit in the past of possibly omitting graphs for a student. And um, this topic that you're talking about today fits in so nicely this month. We are talking about a lot of webinars that deal with tactile graphics and giving access to students and love how this product is helping students to build those tactile uh, graphic skills. Great. So one question that came in is, does it work with all iOS versions and iPad models? I 100% I cannot answer that. Um, I know it does not work with the original iPads. I'm not sure beyond that um, because you know, every couple of years they come out with iPads. Um, I'm going to ask if Fred Otto, could, who's um, the project leader, could you possibly ping um, our um, app person, um, Lawrence Lovelace, and see if you can get us an answer by the end of the webinar. It's a great one for both apps, please, Fred. Yeah, I'm already on that. I hope I can reach him. Thank you so much. 
any other questions, Amy, that came in? I can so, say that, I, let me say that it does work with the uh, recent ones. I just don't know how far back uh, right. you have the older models. Uh, it will go. And of course, in the future, there's always the chance or even the likelihood that Apple will put out a new iOS, which they seem to do, you know, every three weeks or so, um, that will cause some kind of a, a glitch. But, um, you know, once we're made aware of that, those are generally pretty easy to overcome. Thanks, Fred. We got any more questions, Amy? There is. The scratch pad feature that you were talking about, is that a separate app? No, it's built in. If voiceover is on, it's it's not available. So if you if you're using voiceover, then then they they don't work together. Otherwise, the student taps on the button that says scratch and they can bring up that scratch pad. And also when they're entering their answer, they have the option to touch on scratch so they can have the enter answer pad on one side and the scratch pad on the other side so they can you know see the computation they just did. Well, I think we are in a great position to continue moving forward. I'm not seeing anything else in, so we can start learning about literacy. Right. So, um, so we were researchers. Um, you know, I'm a teacher of visually impaired students since 1986. So obviously, I want to research something that's going to make an impact on our students and help them be more successful in this world. So in 2015, as we were completing the Animal Watch Suite research, you know, you have to analyze all the data and you know, all that kind of stuff we like to do. We saw on the numbers, you know, what the data was showing us, um, but also anecdotally from observations I did from comments teachers and students made in follow-up interviews that the students required more assistance from their teacher of visually impaired students when they were doing those two problems in the unit that require that they locate data in a graphic and actually use it. It took them longer to do those problems they were more likely to ask the teacher for help with those problems with the graphics. They were more likely to get the answer wrong on the first try when they were doing problems with those graphics compared to the other four problems in the unit. And we also watched some videos that teachers took of the students working with the graphics. And we found that many students were not systematic in their approach. So they, well, let me just, you know, feel around here or pick it up and look at it all different sides and maybe find a number and that might be the right number to use. They didn't have a good system. Um, they didn't read the title or the key. They just dove right in. So they didn't even know what the graphic was about or they didn't know what red stood for or bumpy stood for. Few students verified what they found in the graphic. So if they found something on a bar graph, they weren't likely to put their finger to hold their place and go over to the Y axis to check the value, come back and then maybe go back and reconfirm. And we found that it took them a long time compared to the problems where they didn't have to go to the graphics. So this got us thinking, we sat around for a while and we thought, you know, we gotta help these kids with, with graphics, both our blind students who are braille readers and our print students, and of course our dual media students. Just because you have some usable vision like Penny Rosenblum here does not mean you are an efficient user of graphics. I still can't read a map folks and I'm 56 years old. Um, and I did not learn those skills as a child and I struggle with them as an adult. I really struggle with them as an adult. Even when you're at a conference and you get the map of the floor where all the rooms are, makes no sense to me until I know where two or three rooms are on that floor. And then I can look at that map and begin to make heads or tails out of it. So we need to build these skills as that teacher said in that quote, second grade, and I really say in preschool. So we like to write grants at the universities at, at its time. Um, I have to commend my colleague, Dr. Carol Beale, who then had moved on to the University of Florida. Getting grants from the Institute of Education Sciences is about a 10 to 12% funding. Um, we had written six grants before we got a grant for Animal Watch VI Suite funded. Um, Carol, we wrote the first time and got Animal Watch VI Building Graphics Literacy funded. And part of that was the compelling data we had from Animal Watch VI Suite. So Dr. Beale was in Florida. I was at the University of Arizona. So we were what's called the sub award here in Arizona. This project ran from July 1st, 2016 to December 31st of 2019. We worked in partnership with the Lighthouse in San Francisco, 
who worked with us to develop our graphics, prepare them for the study, and have those graphics for purchase for you um, from their adaptation store. And I'll go over that in just a moment. So the goals at Animal Watch VI Building Graphics Literacy is to support students at the pre-algebra level. And this is more the sixth to eighth grade level on building their efficiency and accuracy in gathering information from materials presented in graphs and maps. We also realize that as TVIs, that you often need strategies and techniques that you can use so that you can support your students learning. So we wanted to increase teachers' knowledge so they in turn can increase their students' knowledge. We see a picture of a low vision student. She has a double bar graph um, that she is looking at in the book and the iPad is sitting off to her left. So we have 10 units for students to build their graphics literacy skills. And in this picture, we see a student with albinism who's looking at a graphic of a Venn diagram. His iPad is off to the left with the same image that we can't see it, it's white out. His teacher is across the table from him and she is looking at the teacher curriculum. So she's following right along with him. So 10 units, instead of 24, this time we have 10. The first two units are about bar graphs. So we have a single bar graph unit and a double bar graph unit, a line graph, a circle graph, a Venn diagram, two units on coordinate planes. The first one is the positive quadrant one. And then in the uh, second unit, it's all four quadrants. So we're getting into negative numbers, a unit on box plots, a unit on maps, and then a unit where it brings it all together. And we start to have students learn about data tables that graphs come from data, and graphs and data can be put into tables. So one of my favorite units, it's about the flying fox in Australia. And I have to tell you, all of our animals in the Animal Watch VI Building Graphics Literacy are either Australian or African animals. And that's because when we were, um, we submitted Animal Watch VI Building Graphics Literacy grant, and then I went to Australia and New Zealand for a month, I was doing some workshops and I was, um, you know, hanging out with these Tasmanian devils that I was fascinated with. And I said to Carol when I came back, like, if we ever write a grant again, can we have a Tasmanian devil? <laughs> so that's our first unit. All right. So what materials come with Animal Watch VI Building Graphics Literacy? Accessible iPad app. Again, this app builds on Animal Watch VI Suite, but they are two different products. Very similar layout. Both work on iPad. You can use one before the other. Um, you don't have to use Animal Watch VI Suite before you use Animal Watch VI Building Graph um, Graphics Literacy, um, but most people probably do want to do it in that order. Um, we have a teacher curriculum. There are four graphics per unit, and those are available from the adaptations um, store at the Lighthouse for the Blind, and I gave you that link. They come in three different formats, print, UEB, so I'm talking about UEB technical math or Nemeth code within UEB and you will pick your format. Now folks, I know you're gonna get cranky at me and I don't blame you, I would be cranky at me too. These graphics are not free. Um, they are not NOT, not available on quota, okay? So a book of the graphics is $350. And I know you're saying, oh my gosh, that's a really big investment. It is an investment. But let me put it to you in a couple ways that you can put it to your administrator. Less than 1% of the people employed in STEM are visually impaired. We have got to get that number up. If our students are not successful in algebra class that they typically take as a freshman, they are very, very unlikely to go into a STEM field. So we need to ensure our students are ready for algebra and they will get ready in large part by using this product. Next rationale for the teacher. This is, if these graphics are kept um, neat and clean and you know you keep a good eye on them, you're gonna be able to use them for several years with your students. So it's a one-time purchase in most cases or you know at least a three or four year purchase. Um, and the, the book can be shared between students. So you know you could use it with a student for a couple months and then you can pass it to another TVI who can use it with a student. Or if you have two students at two different schools, you can take the book back and forth. So it is an investment. I understand, you know, I'm, I'm a teacher by, by trade folks. 
Um, the content again is about authentic science animals. We see a student who is looking at um, two circle graphs as part of our giant clam unit. She's um, reading the braille on the graph and the iPad is to her right. The teacher curriculum. We learned a few things from Animal Watch VI Suite. People wanted more of a curriculum. So we um, give you a walk through the app and then for each unit, we give you recommended objectives. So you can use these to tie to your lesson plans. We give you vocabulary that is used in that unit. So if you're not quite sure how to define um, scale, for example, um, on a map, we give you a definition. We give you the content and this time we included both the print and the symbol of the graphics so that you can check those out and have a copy of those while the student is working with the iPad. And we also give you some follow-up activity ideas. So we tried to make it more curriculum-like. Um, here are two examples of follow-up activities. After one student learned about the African penguin um, who, uh, who are in oil spills, um, she really wanted to see how they were clean. And so she um, used YouTube to find a video to really learn about that process. Got very interested in penguins, um, asked lots of questions. We have um, a unit that's about coordinate planes. And so this teacher and student worked together to create a floor size coordinate plane um, using tape. And then the teacher would put a cone somewhere on that coordinate plane and the student had to figure out the coordinates and then they would do it in reverse. She would say, go put the cone at you know four, seven and he would have to go do that. Um, they said it was a lot of fun, so much fun if I'm remembering the story correctly, that the regular ed math class got into his coordinate plane too. All right, so features of, of the Animal Watch VI Building Graphics Literacy app is very similar. Again, it works with voiceover. This time we added a button that you can tap within the app for students to have the text read to them or the image read to them a little easier than what we had before. It um, has its own built-in Zoom because a lot of people don't like that three finger um, triple tap with or double tap with um, the iOS Zoom. So we put in our own Zoom. We have the scratch pad is back, checking if your answer is correct. Um, and a score report that can be emailed um, after the student completes a unit. So a few more features. We have a student who's using a refreshable braille display to read the iPad and a coordinate plane is to his right in the book. So each unit is structured a little differently. Um, we condensed that meet the animal down to just um, one screen. We kept that animal sound, always a popular one. We have what we call getting started where the student gets um, one sheet, um, so one graphic, and then they have two open-ended questions because we really want to work on students with their ability to process what they're doing and use their thinking skills. Then we actually teach them skills about locating and interpreting information from that graphic. And so we have 10 um, warm up questions that are multiple choice. And then we have the student go on to um, selecting difficulty. Was this, these 10 warm up questions really hard for me, somewhat hard or easy? Then we want them to do application questions so that they have a set A which uses a different graphic and a set uh, B that uses another graphic. And for each set A and set B, they get four questions, they're multiple choice, where they're locating information. Then they get one math question where we want them to actually take two pieces of information and, and do a computation. And then they get an open-ended prediction question. We ask them at the end of the unit to check in and rate themselves very similarly to that select difficulty. And then we ask them an open-ended question about what they learned. And then we have a conclusion. We see a student, um, she's got her right hand on the iPad and her left hand on the, on the Braille. Okay, when you go into either app, you're gonna, the first thing you're gonna get is a menu, a listing of the units that are available. And any unit that's not started has a little picture. This all is, is said with voiceover. So I, I can't remember what it says, but. It will let you know that you haven't started the unit. If you finish the unit, there's a check mark um, that'll say finished. And if you are um, in progress with the unit, you get one of those um, traffic men working signs um, that you know says in progress. So students um, can you know figure out where they need to go. 
Units do not need to be done in any order in either app. All right, so I mentioned getting started. Um, this is the bar graph for the Tasmanian devil getting started. So it says weight, the title is weights of four marsupials and pounds. On the bottom, we have the x-axis marsupial species, possum, koala, Tasmanian devil, and kangaroo. On the y-axis, we have pounds going from zero to 225 in increments of 50. So we want to know, does the student even know this is a bar graph? Do they know about the X and the Y axis? Are they even able to tell us the height of one of the bars? So um, the first getting started, and they're all, for all 10 units, they're very similar. Describe the bar graph. So if it was a Venn diagram, it would be described the Venn diagram. So let me read that getting started one again. Describe the bar graph and tell what each part is. If you are unsure, please try your best. It's okay if you don't know the answer, record your answer. And we have a built-in recording um, way for the students to do it, you'll see. Second, getting started. What is one thing you know about the Tasmanian devil from the bar graph? If you are unsure, please try your best. It's okay if you don't know the answer, record your answer. So you can see where your students are with their knowledge at the beginning of the unit before they go through and learn techniques for, in this case, gathering information from bar graphs. As I said, we have an introduction to the animal. So this is an introduction to the um, African penguin. We have a very cute picture of an African penguin. And then we have those getting started. So the first um, screen tells you that you're going to be you know, working with African penguins um, and that you're gonna get ready to do um, the questions the getting started questions. So they want you to get the sheet AP1, African Penguin 1 out of your notebook. So let's go ahead and watch a student as she works through the introduction and the um, does the get first getting started question. You'll also see that her teacher going over the vocabulary with her. So this is a little bit longer of a clip, but enjoy. We see a student with an iPad to her right and the notebook to her left. This student is a voiceover user who is swiping. Most live in the countries of Namibia and South Africa. They are very social and vocal birds. People say the African penguins call sounds like a donkey's bray. African penguins do not fly. They have streamlined bodies, short tails, wet feet, and wings like flippers to help them when diving into the water for food. Most of the African penguins diet is fish and squid. They weigh an average of six pounds and are two feet tall. The African penguin has pink patches of skin on its eyes and a black facial mask. The back of the African penguin is black and its belly is white, with spots and a black band. The African penguin is endangered. Causes for the decline in the African penguin population include a decrease in its habitat and decrease in pollution. Okay, so my this unit does have the vocabulary page. Would you like to review the vocabulary before we get started? Yes, please. Okay, boundary. So boundaries on a map are drawn to show divisions between states, countries, political groups, or land and large bodies of water. For example, a solid or dash line may be included in the key to show a boundary. So you've seen those before in maps, right? Yes. Estimate. What does estimate mean? A guess. Mm -hmm. An approximate okay. value. Yep. Nice job. Key. The key tells the categories or regions on the map. Another term for key is legend. Legend. <laughs> In addition, it usually differentiates between each category, region, through color, texture, abbreviations, or um, distinctively shaped data points. You know what the north arrow is, right? We've seen those on maps before. Yes. Can you find it on the page for me? And what does, why is that important? So you'd know the north side, just like when we did coordinates, they mm -hmm. gave you the north side. Yep, I like how you made that connection. Scale. The scale is a ratio between the distance on the map and the actual distance on the ground. Ooh. And then symbol. A symbol stands for something. For example, on a map key, a textured dot generally is the symbol for a city. All right. Are you good? Yes. Should we start? And that's settings. Animal sound. Animal sound. <laughs> The penguin sounds silly, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Does it sound a little bit like a horse? I don't know what. <laughs> oh my god. <gosh. laughs> All right, go on to the first problem, please. Mm. Ready for some questions. Log out. Get sheet AP1 out from your notebook. The student moves her hand to the notebook and confirms this is sheet AP1. 
All right, we're on the right one. We are perfect. You are going to visit to answer two questions. You'll see it on the screen below each question and can double tap with a single finger to make it fill the screen. When you're ready to answer two questions about the map on sheet AP1, tap the next button to continue. Wait a second. There's, oh, I lied. All right, are you good? You're organized? I thought there were two AP1s. Describe the information on the map. If you are unsure, please try your best. It's okay if you don't know the answer. Record your answer. Getting started one. The student is reading the key on the map with one hand. She is moving towards the bottom of the key. Describe the information on the map. If you are unsure, please try your best. It's okay if you don't know the answer. Record your answer. Getting started one. Can you scan with your hands, please? Button. Record audio. Button. Thank you. The student is now using two hands to explore the map. The student's hands are on the scale. What's that equal sign? The equal sign. There's an e there, that H over here. It looks like an equal sign. So that's the scale. So it says scale colon, and then it's number zero. 200 and to then 200 and then a K and an M. Oh. So then that little H, that's your, that's the scale. So that length oh. on the map represents 200 kilometers between locations. Oh. Yeah. I don't think we've seen scales before, right? On maps? Only on the bottom, but not like, not like these. Okay. That was a great question. The student keeps her left hand on the map and returns with her right hand to the iPad. Record audio. Button. Stop audio recording. The map shows all of the African penguin colonies here on the north side. There's a bunch of island colonies and an extinct colony. The countries are mostly on the right side. The ratio on the scale is zero to 200 kilometers. Stop. Play audio. Okay, and students do have an opportunity to um, listen to what they recorded and to re-record as many times as they want. So you had an opportunity to see a Braille reader um, who hasn't worked through this unit yet about maps. One thing I want to point out is that teacher encouraged her to use both hands. And from the very beginning, when you're working with your real students, um, you really want to encourage those two hands. And often with graphs or maps or you know, other visual representation and materials, those two hands work in tandem. So one might be checking on the key to get some information while the other hand is looking for that texture um, to match it up. So these are skills you want to practice with your student. So a TBI shared about watching her student do the getting started. Um, the only thing he didn't respond well to was the getting started, where he had to look at the whole graph and then tell what he knew. He's not one to respond to a prompt and be able to spit it out. It took maybe 15 minutes for him to think about what he was going to say. He could find he could find things in the graph, but to come up with an answer for the open-ended question was something hard for them. This is a skill he should learn. And I think this is really important um, and why I put this in here. These skills don't come instantaneously to many of our students. So they need practice. They need opportunities. They also need us sometimes to step back and give us thinking time. As professionals, we tend to go and we're constantly talking at our students or our children. Sometimes the best thing we can do is to be quiet and give them some time to process. Um, from students about getting started, hearing myself talking about the graph out loud made me focus and think about what I am doing. And often self-talk is a really effective way for us to process. Another student, it was hard to come up with things to say at the beginning. I got more confidence for each unit. And we heard about confidence over and over again in our field testing that we did in the 2018-2019 school year. 
A uh, third student said, it sort of prepared me for the questions and made you think about obvious parts of the graphic that I would have probably have missed without the questions. And that's one thing we really try to stress with this product is that idea of you need to be systematic. You need to slow down and take your time and you need to preview to get information. Okay, um, we have another map warm up problem, which I knew we probably wouldn't get to, but I put it in here just in case. So we're going to skip this one. The student oh, no, I'm sorry. The this, we're not going to skip right this one. I apologize. This is the one I wanted to show. Um, so this is another student in African Penguin um, unit about maps. So this student has already done the getting started questions, and now he's about halfway through the warm up question. So there's a multiple choice question, and he's got three choices. So we see him working with the iPads. So let me start in the map. So let me start that over again. I apologize. It was a wrong one. I wanted to skip. The student has the iPad on the right, and it sits on top of the map of AP2. Sometimes the name of something shown on the map or in the key can give you information. Look at the names of the places along the garden route on sheet AP2. What animals can travelers expect to see as they travel the garden route on Keys Elephant Lion? Sheet AP2. The student looks at the bottom of the map in Braille, then moves to the key. He reads through the key. Returning to the map with his right hand, he then taps the iPad to hear the audio. Sometimes the name of something shown on the map or in the key can give you information. Look at the names of the places along the garden route on sheet AP2. What animals can travelers expect to see as they travel the garden route monkeys, elephants, lion? The student picks up the iPad, holding it six inches from his face, and selects the correct answer. Correct answer. All right, so um, we got to see a student who's a dual learner. So he was definitely using his vision and he was using um, the Braille. Okay, um, this is the one I'm going to go ahead and skip for right now. And another warm up problem with a student we've already seen. It doesn't want to let me skip it. It wants you guys to get to see it. Um, just for time, I want to make sure we have time at the end. So let's just let this video finish out. Oh, technology. It's always your friend, right, guys? Again, sir. Correct answer. There we go. All right. Um, so I'd rather show you this student um, with um, the warm-up problems. So this is a student who was in the cane toad unit. So this is our line graph unit um, where students are learning about the x-axis, the y-axis, you know, how to count up and go over to the left. So this student is going to do two multiple choice problems. This is a student with a visual impairment and a hearing impairment. Um, he's wearing a hearing aid. So you're going to, um, you know, hear the teacher, you know, enunciating very clearly. A data point is used to show the measurement or amount of an observation. On sheet CT1, look at the observations on the x-axis. Each observation is a year starting with 1940. To find out how many square miles the cane toad habitat is for 1970, first find 1970 on the x-axis. Then use your finger or eyes and move up until you find the data point. It is just above the grid line. Follow the grid line below the data point left to the y-axis. What is the value of the grid line on the y-axis? 50,000, 100,000, 150,000. You need my help? Hold on. You need my help? Okay. Wrong answer. Mm. Okay. So it said put your finger here, right? Yeah. And slide it up to the data point. And then if you go all the way over, it's right above this 100,000. It's, well, hold on. So if it's closer to 100,000, right? What's this little half line between 100,000 and 200,000? What's between that? 150. So then you say, okay, is the point closer to 100 or closer to 150? Okay, so check your answer. 
correct answer. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. On GCT1, you found that for 1970, the data. On GCT1, you found that for 1970, the data point is just above the grid line with a value of 100,000. Go up the y axis to the next value, which is 200,000. Did you notice the grid line between 100,000 and 200,000? The value of that grid line is 150,000. What is the estimated value of the data point for 1970? Here's a way to help you estimate the value of the data point. Take a piece of paper or a ruler to help you go straight when moving from a data mm. point to the y-axis. Put your paper or ruler laying it straight from the data mm. point to the y-axis. Move your fingers or right left along the edge of the ruler or a piece of paper until you reach the y-axis. So we kind of just talked about that. So it's saying you should take notice to that little half mark, right, between 100 and 200. And we split it this point for 1970, right? Mm -hmm. We split this point all the way over. It's closest to 100,000, but it's not exactly, right? Mm -hmm. So if you use process of elimination, which one would it be? Uh huh. Correct answer. And they said if you use a ruler, Noah, or a piece of paper, it would show you exactly the line all the way over, okay? On sheet CT2, use the key to find the line for grass and shrubbery. Next, find night 4 on the x-axis. Go up until you find the data point on the grass and shrubbery line. Notice the data point is on a grid line. Follow the grid line until you reach the y-axis. For cane toads traveling on grass and shrubbery, how many meters did they travel by the end of night 4? 250 meters. Correct answer. Good job. And I apologize, folks, I did not load the right video. So we didn't have an audio description on that one. Um, it never fails, right? You got to load 10 videos, you do it wrong. But um, along the x axis were the days one through seven. And along the y axis were um, 100,000 up to 500,000. And there was um, hash, hash marks, so um, grid lines going in between that were at 25,000 sorry, 50,000 um, increments. So the student was having to learn, hey, when a data point isn't right on a grid line, I've got to estimate between 100 and 150,000 and 125,000. So I apologize for not loading the right video, but um, hopefully everybody was able to more or less follow along with that one. All right, so warm up problems. Uh, one student, uh, one TV, I said, I really like, like the explicit instruction in the warm up and errorless teaching, and then he gets to branch on his own. Um, the second one was the warm ups help me get ready for the questions and get familiar with the graphics from a sixth grader. As I mentioned, the students move on then to select difficulty. So um, um, now that you've tried some maps, how well do you understand this topic? And then it's very well. I know the material already pretty well. Um, I've worked on maps before, but I could use some practice and not very well. I need more practice. And this one happens to have a picture of two um, penguins. What we found in our study was that the TBI and the student were both um, typically making the same selection. So the last video I want to show you is of a student doing um, a math question um, in LEM unit A. So she's gone through the 10 warm ups and she's going to do the math question where she has to find the information and then do a math computation. And then she's going to do the um, question A6, which is a prediction question. This student is a braille reader, so I want you to pay attention to how she uses her hands. Let's go ahead and watch a student who uses a refreshable Braille display paired with her iPad. She reads the problems aloud. Problem A5. How many students in all visited the platypus exhibit? The Tasmanian devil exhibit or both? She's looking at the numbers in the Roar and Snore campground. Now moving up 
to the circle for the platypus exhibit, reading those numbers and using the fingers on her right hand to do some adding. She's looking at the intersection and the numbers there, adding those with her fingers. And she's continuing to add numbers now. She is in the Tasmanian Devil exhibit, has read the numbers, adding more numbers on her fingers. Looking at the intersection and going back to her braille display. Correct answer. Problem A6. Imagine that the zoo stops offering the roar and snow campground option. How will the Venn diagram change? What will it look like? Record your answer. She takes a quick check of the Venn diagram and then returns to her Braille display. There would be less students that went on the field trip and there would only be two circles that overlapped, not three. All right, so you had an opportunity to see a student using a refreshable Braille display uses her hands very efficiently to get information from the graphics. After the student does the unit, they do a check-in, which is very similar to the um, select difficulty where they pick from those three levels. And then we end all units with the, what I learned, what strategies work best for you um, um, so that you can get information from maps, record your answer or line graphs or bar graphs, whatever the um, unit focuses on. And that's, again, trying to help students do that self-thinking, that, you know, really processing, not just being rote folks, but really thinking about what they're doing. The students get a brief score report that tells them which questions they got, uh, you know, how many in each set they got right and wrong. And then I mentioned that there is an email score report that you can have sent to you that will um, allow you to see which questions the students got correct on the first, second, or third try. So I want to just shift gears here and try to bring it back together. On one what second, Penny. Penny, this is Fred. <clears throat> um, yes, can you go, go, go back one slide, if you would? Yes. Um, so you, we had a question in the chat about, can the teacher uh, review the uh, recordings that the student makes? And uh, what happens to the recording? Is the teacher able to review it and then discuss with the student? So on the, uh, on the right-hand screen, uh, which shows the score report, uh, you can see some little uh, buttons, uh, look like play buttons. And those correspond to the, uh, the various recorded answers that the student gave throughout the lesson, throughout the unit. You can press those and hear the recordings uh, right there on the spot while that screen is available to you. Uh, those recordings are not emailed to the teacher. Um, as far as I know, they're not. So the, you, you can't really uh, uh, listen to those recordings that the student made in the luxury of your bathrobe in your spare time. You, you need to be uh, accessing the actual iPad at, in the moment. Thanks, Fred. That's a really good point. Um, we, we developed this score report um, for ourselves as part of the research study. You know, teacher to ask for it at the end. And we had the ability when we were running the research study to save those audio files but um, you will not have that ability. That was a great question. Thanks for letting me know we had that one, Fred. Yeah, I don't know if you were wanting to talk about, um, you know, the score report in general, but um, in a way that, it, you know, it's a kind of an acknowledged weakness of the, of the program as it stands now. We acknowledge that that part is not played out as and developed out as the way it should be. 
ideally for the teacher's use, but it also kind of emphasizes the point that Penny made earlier about how student friendly and how well geared this is for students. It's all the attention in the development so far has really gone into um, you know, the accessibility, uh, the, the uh, variability of the settings and so on to make the thing as friendly and as easy to take to, to get into as possible for the student. So um, the, the teacher, uh, you know, the friendliness for the teacher has been a bit of a, a casualty of all the attention given to the students for this. Thanks, Fred, pointing that out to folks. All right. So just kind of want to summarize some of the skills, whether you're talking about a low vision student or a Braille student, uh, a blind student who's a Braille user or our dual media learners, that all of our students need to have. So we're going to go over these five skills very briefly. So one of the effective strategies is being able to have a systematic approach. And in the handout, you can read some of the quotes from the TVI and the student here. But if you're working with your student, you want to teach them from the beginning, check for the title, start at the top, go down, um, read the key. You may have a student who wait, no, I don't like to start that way. I like to kind of just get a big gestalt of what's there and then I'll go up for the title. There's not a right or a wrong way, folks. What's important is that your student has a system so that they don't miss information. A second effective strategy is using the surrounding information. So if your student has um, that, that time to really feel around and look around, okay, there's a dashed line and there's a solid line. I know for sure this is the dashed line, therefore this must be the solid line. They also need to learn to use text that surrounds um, the, 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 you know, the problem or the text that's, Companies that graphic because that's often going to give them clues on what they're looking at. Oh, it's a map. It's you know it says look at the look at the colonies in the map. Well, those circles are the colonies. I'm checking that in the key. I now know that I need to be looking for colonies because the the question is talking about the colonies. So I need to really make sure I can locate those. Another important thing is that our students need to learn to preview especially when they're getting ready to do um, something new. If you can take the time to preview with them, make sure that they have the skills to be able to get information from that type of graphic, then when they're in their content area class, their science, their math class, they're going to be better positioned to put their cognitive energy into learning the content and not trying to figure out, well, how do I know which is the rough texture, which is the smooth texture? If they're already familiar with how to use a key and how to confirm what they're feeling in that key, then they're going to be more efficient with the content. Um, verifying the information. So uh, that video clip of, of the boy with the hearing impairment and the visual impairment working with the line graph, the teacher was really trying to get him to go up from 70 on the x-axis, 1970 on the x-axis and go across the y-axis find what numbers he was between 100 and 150,000, I believe, and then go back and verify where he was. And we really work with the students on strategies that are going to let them verify that they have the correct information. Vocabulary development. Um, we, we put the vocabulary in to each unit because it's so important that you as a professional use the proper vocabulary and that your student learns that vocabulary. At the same time, you need to work with the general ed teacher to make sure that the vocabulary you're using, if you're saying x-axis and that general ed teacher is consistently saying horizontal axis, that's gonna confuse your students. So they need to understand that there's two terms, but then go ahead and use horizontal axis because that's what they're hearing in the classroom. We wanna build our students' vocabulary because things carry over from, from type of um, graphic to the next. So I have a key in my bar graph that's showing me the two textures. I have a key in my map. Once I start to understand scale, I'm able to move that forward into other uh, venues where I run into a scale. In the words of a TVI, I believe the app and graphics are an interesting, motivating way for a student to learn to read graphics. The vocabulary and concepts needed for each graph are included so that the student is ready for what they may encounter in math, science, or any other content subject. 
I feel this is an important skill for students to learn, and this is the best program I've seen to concentrate on introducing the necessary skills for reading tactile graphics and giving adequate practice in using um, the skills. And we see a Braille reader looking at the double um, bar graph and the iPad with the question, and that same bar graph is to her left. So in summary, Animal Watch VI Building Graphics Literacy assists students at the sixth, seventh grade level to build their ability to locate and interpret information in graphics. Some of this math content in some states is eighth grade level as well. We have an accessible iPad app. How do you find it? Go to the App Store, type in APH. When I looked last night, it was way down on the bottom of the APH products. It's not next to Animal Watch Suite, so don't let that confuse you. Look for the purple turtle. Um, it's, so it's available by the App Store. Um, and then we also have the adaptation website at the Lighthouse. This is where you can get a free download of the teacher curriculum at no cost to you, an accessible PDF, or if you want it printed and you know in a notebook, you can purchase it for $75 in print. The graphics have to be purchased and those are available in print. Um, sorry, those are available, yes, in, in print, in UEB, or in Nemeth code within UEB context. If you have a print user, that student can use the graphics on the iPad. However, we really found that most students really want that hard copy. We have um, two, two publications in press, and we have two publications that have come out about work that we've done around the app and also um, about graphics literacy in general. So I'd like to stop here before I talk about Project Inspire and my last minute or two to see if we have any questions or comments, Amy. Great, thank you. Uh, let our audience know that if you do have any questions, this is a great time to drop it in as it relates to this uh, product that focuses on the literacy uh, portion. Nothing, well, I shouldn't say nothing has come in. We've been able to attend to different questions that have come through, and thanks, Fred, for your help with that as well. Um, we'll pause for just a moment to make sure that there aren't any questions, and we do have a hard stop today in four minutes. So, so I so will me, monitor yeah, me, this me, if you want to sure, go on. Sure, the last two slides and then let's, I'll swing back. So briefly, I want to mention folks, Project Inspire, which I'm involved with. Um, this is a five-year federal grant awarded to Dr. Tina Hertzberg. We have, a we have a webpage and a Facebook page. Why am I telling you about this? Because this is a way for you to build your STEM Braille skills. We offer six-week online courses. They're for TDIs, transcribers, paraprofessionals, um, and we also are going to do, be doing a STEM boot camp, virtually of course, for students later on this spring. We are going to later um, in our five-year project be doing a bowl competition. We have two courses that are available um, now for anybody to go to at any time. So those two courses that you can go to on Path to Literacy are Nemeth Code within UEB Context and Strategies Supporting the K-1 Student in Reading and Building Math Skills, or an Introduction to Nemeth Code Symbols Using Grades 2 to 5 and Strategies for Supporting Elementary Students. Those are free, on demand, anytime you want. We are currently recording, recruiting for two courses, so I give you the link to um, the flyer we close registration on February 8th and the courses begin on February 15th. One of those courses is focused on geometry for students in grades three to eight. And there's a lot of information in there about tactile graphics. The other one is about uh, uh, Braille Nemeth stuff for students in grades two to five. Amy, do we have any last questions before we say goodbye? Uh, I'm not seeing um, I'm not seeing any questions, but I will say that we had an applause uh, from that in the audience. I applaud the inclusion of self-evaluation for the students to complete. Uh, that is a comment that has come in. So uh, we thank you, Penny, for taking your time and your diligence to share with us. Um, really great information. I hope that those that are in the audience are walking away with new information and that uh, you are inspired to go out and seek out 
all of these materials, especially since many of you hadn't had an opportunity yet in order to interact with the product yet. So we just want to say thank you for all of that work, Penny, and thank you also, Fred, for being here as a backup for any product-related questions with that.